Well, we got a new song that we're going to share today, and I wanted to read this verse to just remind us something. Do you know that your cells are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? This is God's people. We're gathered together in his name. His presence is already here. Come on, let's just begin by inviting, by saying, Lord, we're here for you. We're honored that you're with us already, Father God. We want you to do what only you can do, Father. Stir in us, encourage us today. Remind us that the hope that we have is our salvation, eternity with you because of what you did. Thank you, Lord. I'm gonna throw a, a curveball. We're just gonna sing and do exactly that. Let's sing, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this house. We sing a holy Spirit, you are welcome here and comfort this place and fill the atmosphere. Cause your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence. Lord, let's do it again one more time. Holy Spirit. You are welcome here. So comfort this place and fill the atmosphere. It's your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us come rest on us as the spirit was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us and come rest on us come down spirit when you move you make my heart pound when you feel the room you're here and i know you are moving i'm here and i know you will fill me calm down spirit when you move you make my heart pound when you feel the room you're here and i know you are moving i'm here and i know you will fill me on us, come rest on us, 
when you need you make my heart bow when you feel the room cause you're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will fill me oh, I know you're here Lord so do it all that you can do do it all As Moses said, if you're not in it, I don't want to go, Lord. Yeah. If you're not in it, I don't want to move. Oh, so Holy Spirit, you're all I want. Oh, you're all I want. Yeah, I sing. when the heart is under fire another way when the walls are closing in when I look at the space between where I used to be in this reckoning I will know I will never be alone there is another in the fire a standing Next to me, there is another in the water, holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, where another died for me.
There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Come on, let's declare. I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me Count the joy come every the darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's thin. i can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in as nothing stands between us Joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Come down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, cause you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here. Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, I don't know what you came in here with. I don't know how you came in here feeling. He can fill you today. There is nothing you have done or ever will do that will separate you from the love that he has for you. He is willing today to fill you. He is here and we can rest and we can know that he will fill us. Are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to receive? Do you want to receive today? what God has for you do you want to receive today what God has for you do you want to receive today what God has for you 
Father, I thank you that you are here and that you are willing to fill us. I thank you that you are a God who completes works that you begin. I thank you that you have begun a great work in us today. God, I pray for each and every heart under the sound of my voice. I pray that it would be willing, that it would be ready to receive what you have for them today. That they would take it, that they would absorb it, and that they would walk out of this place a little bit different than the way that they came in. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this house. We honor you. We praise you. We are so unworthy of your presence. But every week you show up. So we thank you, God. We honor you today. Thank you for being willing to fill us when we need it. We know you're here. Continue the work that you've started to completion. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God is good. God is real good. Amen. Amen. Are you ready to receive, church? Are you ready to receive what God has for you today? Because I'm telling you, he's got something in store. All right? All right. You can have a seat. Have a seat before I keep going. Thank you, worship team. Oh my goodness. How are you guys doing today? Welcome. It's, it's so good to see all the faces in one service united for our summer schedule. 10 a.m. It's on and popping from here on out the rest of the summer. So be here. God is, we, we know that God has some things in store for us. And so we're excited for it. And we hope you are too. I am Pastor Matt. I get the honor of serving our youth here at Weatherstone Church. Um, <clears throat> And before we continue, I want to take a moment um, to honor our 2021 graduates. If you are um, a graduate of 2021, whether that be high school, eighth grade, college, grad school, technical college, if you graduate in 2021, if you have graduated or you are graduating in 2021, here's what I need you to do right now. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. If you are a graduate, if you are a graduate, stand to your feet. Hey, we want to honor you. As Pastor Amber comes, we're going to say a prayer over you, um, but we want to honor you. Get, yeah, hey, give it up. Give it up. Give it up for all of our graduates in the building. Well done. You did it. You made it. What a year. But I'm excited for you because, you know, God doesn't make mistakes and God doesn't have a normal and what God has done is placed you and positioned you for such a time as this. That's from the Old Testament in the book of Esther, and it's true today. God has positioned you in the landscape of time on this earth for such a time as this. So congregation, I'm going to have you do something with the graduates, because this is true for you, even if you're not graduating. And graduates, this is true for you. So I'm going to pray for you, but first we're going to say something together. Isaiah 61. You may not know all the things that are going to happen to you, but you can know, and in God's word we do know, what you are going to do. There is something that you're going to do as a follower of Jesus. So Isaiah 61, I want you to repeat after me. Congregation, do it with the graduates. And this is true of you if you are a follower of Christ, if you are filled with his spirit, this is true of you. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. Do you believe that this morning? that God has anointed you. Graduates, God has anointed you. So you might not know what's going to happen to you, but you don't need to worry about that because you are about to happen to the world for the glory of God. God, I thank you for every graduate. I thank you for your anointing on their lives. I thank you that you have positioned them for such a time as this. I pray a hedge of protection all around them, God. You are the God of angel armies. And God, I thank you that you go before them that you are already in the future because you are outside of time and space, God. Time is no thing for you. You've already gone before them and prepared their steps, God. 
it says that you order the steps of the righteous in your word. So God, I thank you that you will walk beside them and that you will be their rear guard, that you surround them, that you carry them, but that they carry you and your spirit and your power. So we pray that you would fill them, give them everything that they need. And God, I pray that this world would not be the same, that every person they come into contact with would experience the presence of God and the good news of Jesus. And as a congregation, we bless them in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Congratulations. You can be seated. Hey, if you are new with us, there's a connect card that looks like this in the seat back in front of you. Would you grab one of those and fill it out for me? We'd like to get some information from you um, so we can get you connected um, here at Weatherstone Church. Um, you can also text the number on the screen if you don't want to write. Sometimes we don't want to write. So you can text the number on the screen um, to do that. Also on the back side of that card is a place for you to write down any prayer requests you might have, anything that God is doing in your life um, that you want to celebrate because every week we pray for you and we celebrate with you all that God is doing in your life. So make sure to do that. <clears throat> I have a couple announcements for you quick. Um, our 30 for Freedom Run is happening uh, June 26th. So if you follow us on social media, which if you don't, please make sure you do that. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. But June 26th, we put out this week that um, Friday was the last day to, to be guaranteed a t-shirt. But I have great news for you. There was a glitch in the system. And so you have until tomorrow to register and still be able to guarantee yourself a t-shirt. So make sure you sign up. Um, after, after tomorrow, you won't be guaranteed a t-shirt, but you can still sign up all the way up through race to race day or run day, not race, because we're going to run and we're going to walk and some of us are going to crawl. So um, make sure you sign up and be a part of that. Last thing, um, we have a welcome pop-up happening next week, uh, June 13th. This is for those that, of you that are new with us. Um, it's a great opportunity right after service to meet our pastors. Uh, meet some of our staff and find out what's next for you here at Weatherstone Church. So please join us if you can right after service next week. With that being said, um, we have the honor of having a missionary with us today. Um, she is a missionary to the UW Madison. Um, she is the Chi Alpha director there. Um, could you please give a warm welcome to Abby Sawchuck. Hello, Abby. Hello. Thank you guys so much. Give it up. I'm going to let, 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 let it linger. Let it linger. Abby, we are so honored to have you. We're glad you're here with us. Um, I have a few questions I'm going to ask you, and then I just want you to share um, what, what's all going on. So UW-Madison, how did you get there? Yeah, so I grew up going to church and felt called to missions at the age of 12. And I went to North Central, and right as I was getting ready to graduate, yeah, plug for North Central, right when I was getting ready to graduate, I prayed that prayer and was like, God, where are you going to send me? I want to go to unreached people where people need your love. And then I heard about Madison, Wisconsin. And so fall of 2016, I showed up there um, just based on the need um, to start a Chi Alpha. That's cool. North Central in the building. I'm always excited when we have North Central folks. Also, another question for you. <clears throat> we are a church that loves stories. Um, so we want to hear about what God is doing. What is God doing in UW-Madison right now? I know it's been a crazy year, tough year. We talked a little bit earlier about it. Um, but tell us a little bit about what's going on there and what God is doing. Yeah, so even in this COVID year, we weren't able to meet in person um, and have our normal large group services. So like many churches and ministries, we had to get creative. But even through that, we saw close to 200 students come and get connected to one of our connect groups or our small groups this year. And as we talk about students trying to find community, one kind of personal story, um, we have a student internship program. And so we had eight students that were in this internship program this year that were taking online classes through Global University while at UW-Madison. And in a discipleship meeting with one of those students, we were talking loud about Jesus in public. So there's a plug for that too. It sometimes works. And this student walked up to us, a random girl, and she said, were you talking about Jesus? Were you talking about church? We're like, yeah, we were. And she said, I've been on campus for months. I haven't met another Christian. I haven't found a church. And I prayed a prayer last night and said, God, if you really still wanna know me, 
will you bring me community? And so that girl is in a small group. Yeah, you can get excited for that. She's in a small group now. She's attending our church. And we have seen so many of those stories this year. And we had eight students get baptized at the one service we had outside at the end of the year. That's awesome. So good. Listen, I know there's, we, obviously, if you're here, we already support you. But what can we be doing to support you a little more and to pray for you? Well, how can we pray for you? How can we pray for um, the students at UW? How can we do all of that? What can we do? Can you give us some direction in that? Yeah, so we have a couple exciting things happen. Um, one is that we just pioneered on our second campus in Madison, Edgewood College. And so you can be praying for connections there. There's specific needs there to pray that we'll have favor with professors and faculty is that new territory. Um, the second is with a partnership with the church, we just signed a lease for a student center. And so we're in the process of remodeling that, and making that work. And so prayers for that, that the funds will come through, that God will bless that. Um, and then on top of that, just I think the, the classic connections. And so I always share, if anybody here knows students in Madison, one of the best ways that they get connected to us is through those personal introductions. So if you know any student that's in the Madison area, um, get them connected to us and be praying for those connections. As this summer, we start sending like 40,000 emails to students. We chalk like three times a week to try and just get the word out to say, you don't have to do this alone, we're here for you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Abby, for being here. Hey, church, we can come. Give it up. Give it up for them. Thank you. Church, we can, we can pray. We can pray. But how many of you know that sometimes we can be the answer to a prayer, right? I don't know if, I don't know if y'all heard me. Sometimes we can pray, but sometimes we can be the answer to the prayer. So think about that today as we go on to service. She has a table out out um, in the lobby, stop by, have a conversation with her, talk to her, find out what you can do to help, to support, um, and to pray specifically. Um, with that being said, uh, we are not taking up um, offering or, or receiving offering in buckets. We're not passing, um, let me get this right. We're not <laughs> passing offering buckets continuously as we have not done for the last year and a half. Um, but if you wanna give, there's always a way you can drop off in the box in the back um, you can go online or you can text the number on the screen um, to give your tithe and Kingdom Builders offering. With that being said, Pastor Brandon, come on up as we continue our Prison Letters series. Let's go. <laughs> Too much fun. I love that, that we get to, so often when we talk about Kingdom Builders, like we talk about the ends of the earth, which, is, which we're called to. But um, let us never forget we're called to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Uh, and it's awesome that we get to be a part. And we have, we have uh, Kingdom Builders partners all over, really all over the planet, including here uh, in these areas. Because here's what I know. Um, I'm glad that we had graduates stand, and I love graduates. But here's the thing. I, I hope and pray that every one of those graduates, as they, some of them moving different cities, some of them staying local, doesn't matter where they go, I hope that they land in a community. Uh, and, and anything we can do and invest in that uh, is, is huge. We, wouldn't, we could not say we value the next generation if we didn't value where they ended up. <laughs> and uh, to invest in that is, is incredible. So um, we are going to jump in today because uh, I know there's been jokes about one service, so I technically still have till noon. I'm trying not to take all of noon, all right, just so we're clear. For those of you who are, it's your first time here, that was a joke. Uh, I'm not going to talk for the next hour and a half uh, to you. Uh, but I do believe that God has something incredible in store as we dive, continue to dive through the book of Colossians. So if you're with us today and you have your Bible with us, or, or maybe you have a Bible app on your phone, uh, you can jump to Colossians chapter 2. Uh, that's where we're going to be spending a lot of our time today. We will get into Colossians chapter 3 as well. Um, but just to give you a little bit of backdrop, uh, we, are, we are in this series in the prison letters. So we've been going through, uh, we actually did a series on Ephesians earlier in the year, so we're skipping that one, even though it is a prison letter if anyone wants to get technical with me. Um, that one, we're, we're, we just had a series on, and what we're doing now is we're going through uh, Philemon, which Philemon's next week. Philippians is what I was trying to say. There's too many words that sound the same. 
in the Bible, right? Last week, I couldn't get Ephesus and Epaphras separated. One's a city, one's a person, but they were together at one point and whatever, all right? So Philippians, we came through. Now we're in Colossians. Next week is Philemon, uh, and, and it's just, it's, it's super fun to really dive into the context of, of what God has been speaking. And as we're, as we're here, uh, just to, so that we're picking up and understand what we talked about last week, Colossians chapter one is really, it's all about Jesus, Remember, like the one thing I said over and over again, because it's what Paul tried to just nail down, was it's always only Jesus. Like there's, there's nothing else. He would constantly be like, yeah, there's this over here in culture. But no, no, it's always only Jesus. Like it's, 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 this is who he is. If you want a really good recap, honestly, just on that, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 is where it talks about just who he really is, his, his supremacy, his authority, and how he paid it all on the cross. Like that's it that's there. And then with that foundation, Paul then moves into chapter 2. So we have to understand, we started with this understanding of who Jesus is. But, and, but after that, what he starts to talk through is this progression of, all right, now that you know who he is, we have to, through that lens, understand who we are. And hear me in this. We're going to dive into who we are, but that cannot be separated from who he is. Who he is and his identity, there's a reason that Paul starts there, is he's like, you've got to understand who he is because that really defines who we are, that it's not something that's uh, external, something that we can do that doesn't define us, but it's who is in us and who we are. So let's, let's pick up verse 6. We're actually going to read 6 through 17, but we're going to break it up a little bit and stop and talk about it uh, um, as, as we go through, all right? Starting in verse 6, it says, so then... Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live life in him, rooted and built up, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. There's a whole lot there, okay? Let's let's pause for a moment before we keep going. First and foremost, once we know who Jesus is, we have to remain rooted and built up in him, okay? So it's not good enough just to be like, hey, cool, I know who he is. Like, I I know that he's there. Those people are called fans, right? They know who he is. Like, that's cool. Like, that's awesome. But there's there's no relationship with him. They They know who he is and they have some of the basic concepts, but they're not really rooted in, in who he is and in, in what he is. And what we see here, what Paul's talking about is there's two things at play. There is, there is going to higher heights, but there's also going to deeper depths. And what we need to understand as Christ followers, because we, we, just, to, just to grasp this, is that your continued height depends on your continued depth. And even the, 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 the context of how he's writing this, some of this we, we lose when we get into the English, but as he's talking about it and as he's writing it, it's actually a continual verb that he's saying. So it's not just like once you get deep enough, then you can go to a height, right? Like if you're building a building and you're assessing how tall you want the building, you're going to say, oh, this many stories, so for that to happen, I've got to get this deep and this wide to make sure I support it. That's this, there's a lid on both of those things in the physical but in the spiritual, what Paul is saying, for you to go further, you've got to continually dil, uh, drill deeper. For you to, to get closer, for you to go higher, for you to do more, it really depends a lot on how, how deep we, we get, and both of those things are ongoing. And he says in there that our faith then is strengthened when you do what you are taught, okay? So he, after he talks about being rooted and built up, because we have to remain rooted in him, Jesus says that, Right? Remain in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Remain in me. Stay rooted in me. Remain in me. He says once we do that, how our faith continues to grow is that we start to do what what we've been taught. That you would grow in your faith as you were taught. Because teaching comes from observing, right? Teaching is like if if someone is is speaking to you and you're hearing it or or if you're you're watching what they do, um, then you, you learn, but But faith comes from putting it to practice. It's not just about head knowledge. It's not just about knowing all that's there. Faith grows when you start to do it. 
Because then there's the confidence that comes along with faith saying, hey, I can live this life. I can do what I do. I remember uh, growing up, it's fun because my parents uh, showed up today. I remember throughout the summer, um, my dad was always in the garage. The garage door was always open and he was doing something. Like the number of things that I learned just by watching, which is also kind of funny because we're in summer, let's just say this. Um, because as I was thinking about this, the backtrack, like the background music of my entire childhood growing up um, was Bob Euchre on the radio. <laughs> I feel like every memory that happened, the garage door was open, we were in the garage, and somehow Bob Euchre was still talking. I don't know how many games the Brewers played in the middle of the day. It seemed like he was always on. Um, but there was so much of that, that that I observed, but I didn't realize how to do it until I actually got my hands on it. Once I started to do it, then my faith grew so that when my dad wasn't around, if something happened, you were like, oh yeah, I can do that. Why did I have faith that I could do that? Because not only did I observe it, but I started to do it and put it in action. And our faith continues to grow. If you want to know, the, the depth is, is observing, being close to Jesus. The faith starts to grow when you start to do what God calls you to do. And we continue to grow in that faith. And then Paul starts to, starts to really keep going here, verse 7, when he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through through and de- uh, hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of the world rather than on Christ. Now, this is something that he's, he's warning um, the people of that day, but also is something that I think we still experience today. So we're looking at this, we can easily look Old Testament, right? So in the Old Testament, there's these, these laws that get put in place. And most of the laws, honestly, had, had, had really good origin to them. It was, it was those moments of like, hey, God says not to do this, so we're going to put the fence here so that we, we don't do that. Like, let's make a law that we, that we stop here, that way people understand why. The problem is they forgot the why and only saw the fence. And then they started to worship the fence instead of the, the, the why on the other side of it. And Jesus had to come and be like, hey guys... This isn't how you do it. You don't earn redemption. You don't earn grace. You don't earn faith by doing all these things. As a matter of fact, he spoke pretty, pretty harshly to the church and said, for those of you who think that your weight is built on, on doing all of these, these laws, like you don't, even, you don't even follow all of the laws. It's about grace. So we have that moment that we see in, in the Old Testament. Jesus comes and says, hey, it's about grace. It's about relationship, not about rules and religion and all that, which is wonderful. And that didn't even last one generation. <laughs> Jesus ascends to heaven, right? And then all of a sudden, right after that, the church is like, let's put some more laws in place. <laughs> okay? If you look in, in Acts chapter 15, even, even before that, um, there's this moment of like all of a sudden the Holy Spirit gets poured out in the book of Acts on, on people who aren't Jewish. And they were like, wait a second, this is not what we thought. Like how can the Holy Spirit show up in their life if they haven't gone through the ritual customs that, that, are, that are in our life? Like this is crazy. Apparently the Holy Spirit is, is, is not a respecter of persons. It's just wherever God wants to, where it wants to go. It doesn't have to be if you do all the rules and clean yourself up first, then he shows up. It's literally that God can show up no matter where you're at. And that continued to go through. You get to Acts chapter 15. Um, we, we don't have time to go all the way through it. But what we see there is, is this moment called the council in Jerusalem. And it's where Paul comes back to the church in, in Jerusalem. And they were like, we've, we've got to grasp all of this. Now, again, all of the people that are involved in this, not all, let me say most of the people, all of the leaders involved in the Jerusalem council had personally met Jesus. All right? Paul personally met him after his ascension, but on the road, right? You've got Peter, who's a big part of this player. You've got some of the other uh, disciples and apostles that were there. Like, so we're not a full generation. It's not like people are like, hey, we're, we're, we forgot what he said. These are people that were with him. And what they find out is they find out as Paul starts to travel beyond Jerusalem, that there's people who believe in Jesus but for them to come to be a part of the church, they, they're being forced to go through some ritualistic customs. And they were like, we've got we've to take down the barriers. It's not about making sure all the laws are there. It's about, it's about just getting close to Jesus. As a matter of fact, essentially all they say on that is, is um, they're like, hey, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit that the only thing that we would ask you to do, like we don't want to burden you with all of these things. Here's the thing. There's a couple of things that all of us should probably stay away from. Um, Abstain from food, sacrifice to idol, 
don't drink blood, not good for your health, all right? And stay away from sexual immorality. Like, do that, and then, hey, let's, let's follow Jesus together. Because what happened in this moment, even in, in, in the, this first century church, the early church time, is there started to be this moment where it was like, hey, Jesus and this. Jesus plus do this as well. Like, hey, there's this Jesus component, but then if you do this as well, then, then we know that you're really, you're really in. And what over and over, now Paul is still saying to the Colossians, which again, remember, is a church that he's never met before. It's a group of people that he's never actually done ministry in, in this church. Is saying, hey, know this, it's always only about Jesus. Don't allow anything else to come in. That's the importance of last week and, and, and really knowing and understanding who Jesus is because that's the truth that we have to build on. Nothing else. When you start to, start to even see, hear, hear of, of, of parables that Jesus said about wise and foolish builders, so many times we've heard that one, right? It's like, wise man builds on the rock. Foolish man builds on sand. And in our minds, we think, why would somebody build on a beach, right? But when you really think about it, what is, what is sand? It's little pieces of rock. It's little pieces of truth all together, but they're not solid, and what's happening here is Paul is, is explaining to them, hey, hey, don't have parts of truth and then have someone else speak into it. Don't have parts of Jesus plus other things. Don't have, have parts of truth that are there uh, along with human traditions that come along with it. Instead, know Jesus. Know who he is and then stand firm on that. It's always only Jesus. And when we understand that, then all of a sudden our identity comes to light. And he starts to go through because here's why it's so important as Paul continues is that the completeness of Jesus, the completeness of the image that we have of Jesus actually determines the completeness of our own image of ourselves, of our own identity. I want to, I want to read this to you uh, in, in uh, starting again now, we're going to jump into to verse nine, okay? I'm going to tell you what I did here because this is the first time I've ever done it in big church, all right? This is the NIRV, Okay? It's the New International Reader's Version that's there. Uh, if you have kids, this is an incredible kid's Bible, all right? I've never given you a kid's Bible before, all right? I have used the message a couple times because it's contemporary language and all that. But I love the way that it, it lays it out because he's about to start talking about rituals that happen. And sometimes when we're 2,000 years removed, it just, it's, it's off. And there's moments where I'll tell you... the. The number of times that I read the NIRV just to be like, hey, I want to I wanna know this clearer and in a language that's there, um, you can use a children's Bible, guys. It's fine. <laughs> Mine doesn't have pictures. I'd be fine if it did, but it doesn't, all right? But here, I want, I want you to just, just hear this in, in common language. It says this, so God's whole nature is living in, in Christ in human form. Again, we talked about that even last week. The importance of Christ is, is it's God in the flesh. He's saying it again here. He says, because you belong to Christ, you have been made complete. So is, as you are in Christ, your completeness shows up. The completeness you understand of who Christ is, the image that you have of him, actually dictates how much you understand who you are, that your identity comes from. Um, it says, let's continue on to the next one. So then he says, he's the ruler over every power and authority. When you receive Christ, your circumcision was not done by human hands. Instead, your circumcision was done by Christ. It says, he put away, let's keep going. He put away the person you used to be at that time since power ruled over you. When you were baptized, you were buried together with Christ. And when you were raised to life together with him, when you were also baptized. So we, again, we talk about baptism. They go under the water, and when they come back up, if you'll hear the terms, this is where it comes from. It's like, hey, you died with Christ, the old person is gone, and when you came up, you were raised to new life again because your identification with Jesus of who he is. It says you were raised to life by believing in God's work. Here's the reason that I went to NIRV on this. Because sometimes if you're looking in your NIV Bible or uh, ESV or whatever, whatever translation you're reading, we get hung up on this, this concept of circumcision. But what Paul is trying to tell us 
in this, in this passage of scripture, sometimes he says, actually in Romans chapter two, he says it's not a circumcision physically, it's a circumcision of our heart. It's not about, it's not about doing all of the right things, it's about, it's about God doing something inside of you. It's not something that happens with human hands, but it's Jesus who came and, and transitioned and put a new covenant in your life. What, what, what circumcision was Old Testament was it was an external reminder of a covenant that God made. But it was also something that was like, it became what everybody had to do. It was like, it was there. And, and Paul is saying, it's not about that anymore. It's not about going through the right motions. It's not about human tradition. It's about understanding who Christ is and understanding who you are complete in Christ so that you can move forward. And with that, that's all it takes. And in that moment, you, you're, you're, you're baptized. Again, let me, here's a shameless plug for baptisms. We're doing baptisms uh, at the end of July. I think I wrote this down, July 25th. We're doing a church picnic together. It's gonna be awesome. Weather permitting, we're gonna do it outside. It's gonna be great. If you have not been baptized, here's really what it is. Because it's not a, a ritual even that we do that, that is there because we don't wanna fall into this as well. But what we see biblically is it's a person who says, you know what? I identify with Jesus. I understand what, what, what this means. The old me is gone. That, that I've been saved I've been, I've been cleansed, I've been, I've been washed clean because of what Jesus has done in me. And now because of that, the old is gone and the new has come and I've been raised to life. Just like Jesus was placed in a tomb and then came out of the tomb. It's like, hey, that old life has been placed in a tomb and now I'm coming out a new creation, new in life. And it's an, honestly, it's an awesome moment for us as a church to celebrate that God still does it. That God still heals and I think too often we, we love the salvation piece of it and we're like, hey, God has saved us. But then when we come back to life, we stay in our own tomb. We stay in the, in the, in the, in the, in the world that we've created. We don't walk into the new life that God, is, that God has in store for us. And what baptism really is, is this external moment of saying, hey, I'm walking into what, what God has in store for me. He said, sin used to have power over you. It used to rule you. And it doesn't anymore because Jesus paid the price. So what you were in the past, because of the cross, you are now new. And the sin that you see and have you captured before is no longer has the power on you because you've been made new. Sin, yes, had, had power and had captive over that old person. That person's gone. And you're a new creation in Christ, therefore you can walk in freedom because of, of the work that he's done. And he continues on on this, okay? Keeping going, uh, verse 13. We'll jump back to the real NIV. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. They're, we could read it all in Greek if you wanted to, but nobody would understand it. All right. It says this. When you were dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your flesh, so you, you, you were going through the motions, but you weren't actually, like, like you didn't allow God to get inside of you. It says, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave all of your sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it all away and nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, have, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So he gets back into this moment of saying, hey, before you were trying to work on, on it on your own. Can I tell you this? Um, I think one of the biggest struggles that we still have today as followers of Christ is, is having our identity caught up in our actions and our works. And saying, hey, like, and, and we understand sometimes, like, hey, this is what I used to be. Like, if you get somebody's testimony, you're like, hey, this is, what, this is what I used to be. But then we almost get into this moment of having to justify, like, hey, I used to do that, but now I read my Bible every day, and I pray, and I, 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 I. Like, here's the thing. I hope that we all do. I hope that we all do. But who you used to be ends with, and then Jesus. And then Jesus showed up. And man, because Jesus showed up, I love to talk with him, and I love to pray. And because Jesus showed up, I love to get into the word, and I love to just know more about his heart. I love all of these moments, but, but I do that because Jesus. It says when we were still sinners, when you were still trying to make it on your own, when you were still trying to go through the motions to justify yourself, Jesus gave up his life, and you experienced freedom. That's why we do everything else. 
Our identity isn't caught up in what we do. Our identity is caught up in who Jesus is and what he's already done for us. That's who, that's who we are. This victory has been won, and it was won while we were still dead in sin. But because of that, guys, this, is, this gets really, really fun, all right? And I keep watching the clock. I'm not going to end in eight minutes, all right? Verse 16. <clears throat> Verse 16, it won't be long, guys, it won't be long. Verse 16, let's keep going. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, the new moon celebration or the Sabbath day. They are a shadow of things to come. In reality, however, or the reality, however, is found in Christ. Now, let me first tell you what this is not saying. This is not saying that we have freedom to do whatever we want. We're going to eat and drink whatever we want. We're going, to, we're going to do whatever we want. What he's addressing here is in this day and age, because of the festivals that were there, they were like, I'm going to eat this at this time, and I'm going to do this at this time, but I'm going to refrain from this during this season because of their, and then their identity was caught up in that. It was like, hey, I, I, I followed all the rules of every festival. Check me out. Like, I got, I, got my, I got my Boy Scout badges because I did everything right, tested out, I made it, Right? I said Boy Scout because I didn't know how many people would catch the Royal Ranger reference because that's the Christian version of, of, of cashing out. Last week I made a Missionettes reference. Now I'm making Royal Rangers references. We're, we're getting old schools coming up. I might have to, I need to find my Royal Ranger stuff. Mom and dad are here. I don't know. They probably either burned that or gave it to me in a tote forever ago and it's sitting in my basement someplace. All right? Essentially what it's saying is all the badges that you've earned, they don't define who you are. All the, all the things that you've done right don't define who you are. Instead, what they actually do, what the rules are there in place for, is they are there to give you a shadow of what it's going to be. Let me put this in our context. You don't get righteousness. You don't get justification. You don't, you don't, you don't become sanctified. These are big church words of like getting right with God, right? You don't get that by making sure you come to church three out of four weeks a month. You don't get that by, by making sure you're in a life group and, and serving in different places and, and doing all of the things right. You don't get to, to righteousness through that. You get there because of Jesus Christ. Now, what he says is all of these things are a shadow of that. I hope that church is a glimpse into heaven. The, the, the line that we sang today as the space between wears thin. Is that prayer of like, God, I want your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I know I get it there. I want to experience it here, right? Like, like these moments, they're a shadow. We get to see it. We get to get close. But remember that the real thing, the reality is Christ. That's what we're pursuing. We're not trying to check all the boxes and do all the right things. We're trying to get closer to Jesus. So, so remember that our Jesus is who Jesus is. We have to understand who he is because it's all always only about Jesus. But in that, we understand our own identity isn't wrapped up in who we are and what we do. It's about who we know and who's in us. Right? Come on. You got to clap because I lost my place anyway. So here's the transition then. There's, there's more in, in chapter three. Again, I encourage you, read all of it because I can't, I can't hit it all. But as, as, as Paul defines who Jesus is in chapter one, then with that who we are and our identity in chapter two, he then moves into chapter three where he starts to talk about what it looks like. So, so it's not what defines us, but there is some importance in understanding who Jesus is than who we are in our completeness in Christ. So then what that means is there's some things that we do. And he says this, uh, starting in verse one, chapter three. If then you have been raised with Christ, okay? Pause for a moment before we even go on. He's now speaking to people who are Christ followers. He's now speaking, he's, he's saying, the reason that's important is because we're about to get into what, what we do but he makes it very clear before we get there that Christ is the one that helps you do what you do. It's not what you do that makes you closer to Christ. Okay? Just want to make that part clear because Paul made it very clear. So if you know who Jesus is and if you identify with him, if, you're, if your identity is made complete because of who he is and what he's done, who's, who is in you, not just who you are, right? Then it says... 
Seek the things that are above, right? Now, if it stopped there, I almost feel like, I almost feel like he was like, seek the things that, that are above, right? And if he would have stopped there, you'd have been, we could have made up whatever that was. And he was like, no, no, no. Um, seated uh, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. It wasn't like, seek higher learning. Seek higher things. Like, seek enlightenment. He was like, no, 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 no. Let me, let me make it very clear. Seek the things that are above. Christ, right hand of God. About as clear as I could get. Like, we need to seek the things and go after, pursue Christ. Set your minds on things above, not on things that are on the earth. So if we've been raised with Christ, we know what we seek. That's why chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 is so important. When we understand who Jesus is, that is who we seek. The reason that Paul even started by saying, hey, I'm going to tell you first who Jesus is. I mean, this is, this is who he is. And then with that, here's who you should be. Now, this is what it looks like. Make sure that we always remember that progression. It's who Jesus is first and foremost. And then Jesus defines who we are. And then that's what it looks like. Because I think sometimes we get it backwards. And we're like, hey, I got to clean myself up. So I got to do all the right things so that I can, I can come closer to Jesus. Can I just dispel a myth right now? Because I don't know if you're in this room or if you're watching online. But there's a lot of times where I hear people say, like, I just don't know if I'm ready. I, just, I, I, don't, know if I'm, I don't know if I'm there yet. Like, I've done a lot of things. Like, I got to get some things in order. And then, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll figure things out with Jesus. Can I just tell you, um, we can't figure it out. <laughs> There's nothing we can do to make us any better, to get us any closer to Jesus. The best thing that we can do is understand who he is, get our identity in him, bring him into our life, and then he will fix everything else. And what he's saying here is it's like, understand even the progression of my letter to you, church that I've never met before. (laughs) Know Jesus. Have your identity rooted and complete in who he is, and then your actions will change. It's not about behavior modification. It's about, it's about heart transformation. And when your heart gets changed, your behavior follows, all right? So he says, this is what it looks like then. Okay, we're gonna jump to, to verse five. I'm just gonna kind of run through these because this is where he goes two directions. And he actually speaks this in the Greek. Uh, he's, he uses words uh, like, like clothing words. So he literally says, I want you to take this off and then I want you to put this on, all right? He's starting in verse five. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he lists them. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. We're gonna come back to that in a moment, just a second. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off the old self with its practices and have put on a new self which is being renewed in the knowledge, okay, comes back to growing deeper and higher, being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Here's the entire thing wrapped up right there. He says you got to know who Jesus is because you're, you're being renewed in the image of the creator. Your identity comes because of understanding who his image really is. And with that, here's the things that we get rid of. And do you catch what he said? The first list that he had was all actions. The second list that he had, which he said, okay, now that you're there, don't do this, was all thoughts and emotions, which is super similar to Jesus, right? When the laws were there, they were like, we're going to try and stop the actions. And Jesus was like, it's not about your actions, it's about your heart. They said, don't murder. I say, don't hate. They say, they say don't, don't commit adultery. I say, don't lust. Because it's not just about making sure you can go through all the motions. It's about making sure your heart is in the right place, making sure you understand God. Because here's the thing, and he says it at the top of it. He says, he says this is actually idolatry. And here's our struggle. So often we get to a point when we think idolatry, and when we hear it in Scripture, we're like, oh, I don't have any little like figurines that I burn candles around and pray to. Which, yes, that is idolatry. You know what else is idolatry? Putting your flesh above God. 
You know what else is idolatry? Spending, spending more of your time and energy focused on, on your job than focused on growing closer to Jesus. There's these moments where what Paul is getting to is the same thing that Jesus is getting to and saying, hey, you know what? There are times where we actually let our flesh and our self be idolatry. Idolatry is just worshiping something else. Who has our gaze? Who has our, our worship? Because when it's some, anything short of God, it's idolatry. But when we turn around and we say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore because God has my heart. God has my emotions. God has my attention. So I'm going to do this not because I want to do it better or I want, I want life to feel better and not walk into issues and problems, but because I love Jesus this much and I know who he is and my identity is caught here. That's called worship. And the other side, anything less than that is considered idolatry. And too often, I think, I think we, we, we fall into this moment of allowing our flesh to be there. Can I also tell you this? And I skipped over this. You're going to have to go back and read it because I don't have time. Paul talks at the end of chapter 2 about when we focus on behavior modification, that's also idolatry. When we just try and live better, really what we're doing is we're saying, look what I did. I fixed myself. Yeah, God helped me, but I fixed myself. Instead of saying, hey, I had nothing to do with it. Because of Jesus, now I live this way. Not because I did anything, but because when you get so close to Jesus and when you understand who he is, there's nothing you desire more than just to be close to him and to live the life that, that, that he desires, to do the things that, that he has called us to do. As a matter of fact, just I'll give you the words that he uses because it's awesome. He says, um, there's an appearance of wisdom. So when we're just trying to fix ourselves, when we go after behavior modification, it says there's an appearance of wisdom, it's self-imposed worship, and false humility. That's what it's, it's, it's in uh, uh, 23, chapter 2, 23. Chapter 2, verse 23. It's this moment of saying, look, look at all that I've done. Look, look, Jesus, I fixed myself. Now we can work together. In case you're wondering, it's, there's nothing that I can do that's worth anything other than partnering with Jesus, let me even read, following Jesus, because it's not a partnership, he's Lord. It's not like, hey, I got some thoughts on this, God. Like, I'm sure you've probably thought this through, but hey, I'm just going to throw mine out there as well. It's like, no, no, no. It's all because of you. What do you need me to do today? What do, what do, what do you... Because, because my identity is so wrapped up in understanding who you are, how, how do you want me to live? But here's the incredible thing. He says what we take off, but then he also says, I'm just going to read this through for you. Verse 12. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves in compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. 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 Patience, we can, hey, Shakespeare made up words. We all think he's a genius, all right, guys? Like, I'm going to make up my words myself. Patience, -ness. All right. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against each other. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were all called to peace. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here's the thing. Can I tell you? What happens here at the end? How we, how we make sure that it's not about us. And it's not about making sure that just we're, we're changing our actions, but really getting closer to Jesus. It's who gets the praise at the end of the day. It's, it's are we here and really saying, you know what? I'm going to do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus. The number of times that he even says in here, like, hey, the word of Christ, right? The peace that Christ gives. Like, like it's not ours. It's not like you can just conjure it up. Like, I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to, work really hard and I'm going to focus and I'm going to be peaceful whether I like it or not. <laughs> no, it's growing closer to Jesus. And when that happens, here's the things that we get to put on. 
Here's the things that, that, that God says, hey, I need you to take this off, but I'm gonna give you something even better. Take off the old rags that are there and I'm gonna clothe you in something incredible. But how we keep it on is we give the praise to Jesus. Can I just say this again? Everything we do isn't about us. It's not about me. Everything that I do isn't, isn't even about Weatherstone Church. I hope that, that God in his sovereignty blesses this place. I don't, I, don't do it, I don't do it to try and be a better husband and father. But here's what I know. When we give Jesus the praise, when we give God the glory, everything else, all the blessings and all the promises that he gives us, he starts to rain down. Isn't it crazy that the creator of the universe, who also happens to be the creator, creator of you and me, would know how to live this life the best? And when we understand who he is, and our identity is caught up in who he is, because our completeness is, is in him, that we start to live a life like him, then this is what our life looks like. But when it looks that way, it's never about, look at me, look at the badges that I've earned. It's always about, man, it's because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. I'm gonna, I wanna pray as we, as we close. And I just wanna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place. And I hope that, we, that, that what we catch here from Colossians, again, there's a, there's a little bit more that we're not gonna cover. There's some about families, but I, I, I think we're gonna do a, a relationship series, so we'll catch the end of that. And then really, chapter four is just a farewell. It's like, hey, these guys are doing good. So, the book of Colossians is this, is the progression of saying, know Jesus, get your identity caught up in completeness in who he is, of how you see him, and with that, when your heart changes, your actions follow. And I think a lot of times there's, there's been moments where we've, we've maybe even heard that differently through, through people with, that are well-meaning. They're trying to get us to to clean up our life or, or act better. But I want you to hear this today. I think there's a lot of people that are striving to do all the rules. They're striving to do all the motions. They're striving to, to get it all together in someday hopes of pleasing God. Can I take that burden off you today and let you know this? Jesus has already paid the price on the cross of all of that. And our job, what we do the most is we keep growing deeper so that we can go higher. And as we get deeper, God continues to take us higher. And as we're rooted in him and the image of Christ and understanding who he is, we, he's going to take us further in places like patience, in places like love, and in places like knowledge and wisdom that's talked about there. And today, I just want to ask you, with nobody looking around, if that's you and you're saying one of two things. Number one, I've been trying really hard on my own. Whether, whether I know Jesus, but I've still been trying to do it on my own, or maybe I've never given my life to Jesus. And, I've, and, I'm, and I'm trying really hard, but I just can't get close enough. Can I tell you today, Jesus is a free gift. Not completely free, but he already paid the price, so it's free for you and me. And today, all you have to do is receive him today. I just want to ask you, nobody looking around, if that's you today and you're like, I want to get right with Jesus, I want to know him. I want to, I, want to, I want to ask him into my life and live this life of freedom. If that's you today, whether you've been in the church for a long time or maybe it's your first time, I just want to ask you to do this. Would you just lift up your hand right now so I can pray with you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see you. It's like a row back there. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I see you. Thank you trying to scan up top as well, as much as possible with lights. So awesome. I see you. I see you. Thank you. That's awesome. Know this. It all, it all rests on Jesus. It all rests on Jesus. And I love that he still today is in the business of saving people. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to lead you in a prayer. Romans says it like this. It says that if you believe with your heart, and I believe those of you that raise your hand, I believe that's you today. And even those of you watching online, I know I can't see you through a camera lens, but I know this, Jesus sees you. And today can be your day as well. 
And Romans says that if you believe in your heart, and I believe you've done that right now even by raising your hand, and confess with your mouth that you will be saved. So I'm just going to lead you in a prayer today. There's nothing magical about, about this prayer. It's literally just understanding who we are. We're sinners who have fallen short. And understanding who Jesus is, the Son of God that lived a perfect life and paid the price. And because of that, we get to receive his gift of salvation. Because of that, our identity starts to shift and change to be more like him. And with that, because of the heart change that's there, we get to live the life that he's called us to live. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but I want to do this. Everybody here, we all pray together because we're family. We have a sign that says, welcome home. We, we truly do believe that. And nobody prays alone here at Weatherstone Church. So I want to, we all to pray with me. But if this is you today, know this. This is your moment to, give, to get right with Jesus, to receive that gift of salvation. Would you repeat after me and say, dear Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I know that I don't deserve it. But today I believe that you died on a cross for me to pay the price for my sin so I can be clean. Today, cleanse me. Come into my life. Lead me and guide me. Be Lord of my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, can we give God praise for what he's doing in this place? Come on, it's all about him. It's all about him. Can you do this? Can you stand to your feet all across this place? Um, it's not just like, I love that we do, we do salvation. For those of you that, that said yes to Jesus today, I can't, I, I can't celebrate with you enough. Know this, scripture says that heaven is celebrating right now because of you. You realize like you are the, you are the guest of honor in heaven right now. That's, that's, that's the party that's going on. That's incredible. But everyone in this room, because of who Jesus is, we get to grow deeper. We get to, we get to grow closer to him. And I just encourage you as we take these moments just to, to allow God to speak to us, allow the word that he has spoken to us to be implanted in our hearts so that when we leave here different, that we would take these moments right now. Say, God, you're worthy of it all. Like, you're, you, you're worthy of everything that's here. And it's our opportunity not just, to, not just to sing some songs and hear a message and feel good about our day, but know this, that when our focus is on Jesus, whenever we come into his presence, we always leave changed. We always leave different. Today, this is our moment to say, God, what today do you want me to take with me? On the other side, what today do you need me to leave here? What did I come in with, whether it was a thought whether it was an addiction, whether it was, whether it was a, a, whatever it may be that's there, what do I need to leave here to allow you? What do I need to take off so that I can put on what you have for me? And I believe God will continue to respond to that as we worship him because it's not about us, it's not about what we do, but our worship is always focused on him. Come on, let's worship together as we close. Do